Good afternoon. We've got an opportunity this noontime for a conversation with Kamal Dervish, who is the, he's a scholar, he's an economist, he's a diplomat, he's a politician, uh, he is the administrator of the United Nations Development Program, which makes him the third highest ranking person in the United Nations. Um, he is a native of Turkey. He served as that country's uh, uh, Minister of Economy and Treasury. And he also served as a member of parliament representing Istanbul, which is not a bad city to be representing. Uh, he's not new to global governance. He served at the World Bank for 20 years. He was the World Bank's vice president for poverty reduction and economic management. And before that, he was the vice president for the Middle East and North Africa region uh, and was active in promoting the Middle East peace process in that role. And as if that weren't enough, uh, a tough enough assignment, he directed the Central European um, uh, Department at, during the fall of the Berlin Wall and during the time in which former Warsaw Pact nations became better integrated into uh, Europe as a whole. And during that period was responsible for working on reconstruction in Bosnia uh, and reconciliation, peace and reconciliation in Bosnia. Uh, so he's taken on only very large and very tough assignments. He's a graduate of London School of Economics. He got his doctorate at uh, Princeton University, uh, where he later taught. Uh, he co-authored a textbook, a fundamental textbook on economics, and most recently he authored a Brookings Press book entitled A Better Globalization. So like many people in this room, he is someone who is, uh, when he faced with a large problem, uh, is undaunted. So we're going to talk to him about, uh, about some of those problems. And I'm, what I'm going to do, if you don't mind, Dr. Dervish, is to start with some questions that relate to your prior writings and and prior experience and then move on to your current challenges. Um, you begin, and, and then I'm going to, because this is Global Philanthropy Forum, I will take us back to what your experiences teach us uh, uh, and how, how they should guide us when it comes to philanthropy. Um, you began your most recent book by a quote, with a quote from uh, Georges Montpio. Uh, in which he wrote, everything has been globalized except our consent, which is a wonderful uh, statement. And it's true that the United States, uh, for example, takes large decisions that have a large impact on the rest of the world, and the rest of the world doesn't have a vote. How do we take other stakeholders into account? Or how should we? Well, thank you, Jane, first of all, for inviting me. It's great to be here. You know, I, I really love that quote because it catches one of the big challenges and dilemmas, I think, of our time. And that is that, indeed, the world is globalizing. It will globalize even more. I mean, we're in the process. It's, it's advancing further. Markets have become more and more global. Uh, everybody really does depend on everybody else. And yet, the institutions, and particularly the political institutions, that, to use uh, Ruggie's term, have been embedded at the national level. You know, the, the market has been embedded in, in, a, in a nation state, in political institutions, in, in uh, judici judiciary uh, uh, powers, and so on, that make the market outcomes uh, acceptable and managed in, in nation states. At the global level, we're, we're at the very infancy of that. Markets are global, but political institutions remain very national and even local. When I was in Turkish parliament, I realized how correct the phrase is that all politics is local, you know, because that's the way it works in politics. And yet, global problems have an impact on everybody. And I think that we're all struggling with this. Now, of course, when you're a very large country like the United States, you do have more control over things. You can influence more things than a small country. And I would say that uh, in the US that the feeling of being powerless in, in today's world is less than in much smaller countries. But even, I think recent events show that even in a very large and powerful and rich country like the United States, you know, one feels that alone you can't handle these problems. So that's why I picked that quote. And uh, the consent part is also very important. 
because you know, in, in the, particularly with the advance of democracy, uh, people want to have the feeling that they have consented to certain outcomes, that if something is happening, uh, it's partly at least because they've agreed to it. And so much is happening in the world where people feel that they're distant from it, they don't understand it, and certainly they don't feel like they've given consent to it. That's, I think, what that quote catches. And not only is decision-making local, but also the generation of resources is local. Um, have you thought, I mean, the, the capacity to tax, for example, right. um, have you looked at mechanisms for raising resources across borders? Oh, that's a very dangerous question. I'm not sure whether it's a law or just a, you know, a, a kind of attempt to have a law, but there's something in Congress would actually penalize anybody who says anything like that. Uh, <laughs> you may, <laughs> so I'm careful. <laughs> No, but um, you know there is the fact, which I think one can understand, as you say, that you know people, the, the, the ability to tax is a national government's ability, and in a democracy, I think taxpayers, citizens, have a very important right to insist that they have to give consent to, to that tax and to how their tax money is spent. So I can understand, of course, that there's a lot of resistance everywhere, particularly in the U.S., to having tax monies then you know, channeled or spent beyond borders that citizens feel they can control. And yet, on the other hand, there's a tremendous need for burden sharing. You know, uh, if, there an, if there are big environmental issues in the world that we have to deal with, how are we going to share the burden? The whole global warming debate, carbon emissions, I think has a lot to do you know, with this burden sharing. Uh, China and India are now emitting a lot but they did very little in the past. What is their fair share compared to the US that you know, emitted a lot in the past and continues? These burden sharing issues are, are, are very, very critical. And therefore we need, I would put it um, in the following way, we need burden sharing mechanisms. Mm -hmm. We need ways where global issues, global bads can be fought with resources which are pooled and where everybody feels they're giving a fair share. Uh, but on the other hand, I do, you know, I really do agree that it's a citizen's most fundamental right to watch where the tax money goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There have been some interesting, well, there, there have been various proposals for, for taxes, like yes, the Tobin the tax tickets. or airline tax. Uh, yeah. Have you given consideration to those? Well, there have been, you know, uh, there are, uh, as I said, global bads like carbon emissions. You know, so if you could tax carbon emissions, uh, you would be doing a good thing. We can debate how much, you know, how it would work in practice. But the general idea, just like putting high taxes on cigarettes, you know, is generally considered a good thing. So I think we should do that. At the same time, there is then the question: What do you do with the revenue? And conceptually, these are two different questions. You can, of course, tax cigarette smoking and then use the proceeds not just for lung cancer research, but for all kinds of things. The same goes for potential carbon emission taxes. One could use the revenues in various ways, but one idea is to use it for to fighting global poverty and to therefore have a kind of double winner whereby you tax a bad thing and use the proceeds for a good cause. Uh, making us want more bad things. <laughs> well, no, you're taxing them, so you're making it more expensive, you know. Uh, but, and I, I do believe these general approaches are good ideas. Now, of course, the Tobin tax is another such, such idea, more controversial, because wh while there is general agreement that carbon emissions are a bad thing, uh, international, even speculative capital movements, some people think they are basically part of the global market, they're good, the greater depth there is in financial markets, the better, the more money is flushing around, the better, whereas others think I tend to agree with the second position, actually, that short-term capital flows can be a big problem. So by putting a small tax on short-term speculative capital flows as opposed to long-term investment and long-term capital, you, you, there are people who, who think that it will reduce the volatility of capital markets. But uh, you know, while I agree that the, it, the volatility is a problem, I'm not sure that the tax, the way it could be implemented, could actually solve the problem. So that's a little, you know, it's a more controversial um, proposal. So I, as you know, what's been finally agreed by some countries, not all by any means, 
but I think by more than a dozen countries, is that there will be a small tax on airline tickets, business class, basically. So economy classes, you know. Basically, business class ticket, and that the proceeds would go to uh, fight in disease. And I think that's a small beginning. I think these kinds of initiatives can help. Uh, some countries may do it voluntarily. I would, for example, you know, I, I know the US will not enact it as a tax, but perhaps uh, you know, if you had a choice when you buy your business class air ticket to add another $5 for fighting uh, disease, maybe people would do it you know, in a philanthropic way uh, voluntarily. And I think that would then be, uh, would not contradict I think the U.S.'s position that you know, these taxes should not be global taxes. But you know, there could be a mixture of some countries who use it in a tax form, whereas other countries who just provide the opportunity for citizens to contribute. Now, foundations have come together with the private sector to try to find some ways yeah. in which to uh, finance the solution of a global danger and uh, just, take emerging, just take infectious diseases. Sure. For one, here you've got on the one on the one end. I mean, obviously, market forces do not uh, reward investing in the diseases of the poor because there's right. no one who can afford to buy vaccines or medicine. So, on the one end, you've got the Gates Foundation uh, offering to finance. Um, I'm sorry, the Rockefeller Foundation offering to provide the venture capital. And on the other end, the Gates Foundation offering advanced market commitments um, as, as just one means of generating this kind of, um, these kinds of products for the poor. Does the UNDP get involved in those kinds of, um, those kinds of uh, cross-sectoral partnerships that are aimed at unleashing either more ingenuity, more innovation, or more financing? Absolutely. We, we have an increasingly you know, wide-ranging a partnership with the private sector and civil society. I think um, a long time ago, and I, I don't know whether Bill Draper is still in the room, but anyway, I think he was the leader who really got the UNDP into partnering uh, with the private sector. I think uh, at that time, about 15 years ago, you know, the UNDP realized that without the creativity, the flexibility, uh, and, and, and the entrepreneurial spirit inside the private sector worldwide, you know, we couldn't fight poverty just, just via governments. And that has spread, that has become much more important. We actually work very closely with the, with the Gates Foundation and with others, also the Rock, uh, Rockefeller Foundation. What we contribute to these ventures is really the in-country presence, you know, the network of people whom we have in all, all the developing countries in the world if I'm not mistaken, I think 136 developing countries. And our networks are very grassroots. They're very local. Most of the staff is actually from the country. There are very few international staff working in, in these offices. And I think that's what we're, where we contribute the, know, the knowledge of the country. Uh, in, in many countries, we have regional offices, not just in the capital, but in, in the provinces. And I think by using these offices and the networking skills of, of our staff, um, we, we can really work with the private sector in very creative ways, and we're, we're doing that. And, and the philanthropic sector as yeah, of well. Of course, the philanthropic. Yeah. yeah, I mean, private, broadly speaking. Yeah. Right. You, when you wrote, in fact, Bill Draper's back there, the former I head of the UN Development oh, Program. I could <laughs> see the yellow tie. The, um, you don't just head up UN Development Program, although that ought to be enough. You head up, you chair the whole UN Development Group, and that is to say all the agencies that are in any way involved. And, and before you took this job, you did write that those agencies should be rationalized. There should be greater kind of planning, a, a, grant, a greater design. Are you now in a position to impose a design, uh, and do, do you still feel that? share that view? Well, um, first of all, I'm sure many in the room are chairing various groups. Chairing just means chairing. <laughs> it doesn't mean, you know, you're the boss. Uh, you can facilitate, you can, you know, but you're chairing. <laughs> um, so there is, I mean, that's the role I have in, in the development, on the development side of the UN. I do believe that some reorganization, modernization, harmonization, you know, is needed. I think what happened over the years is that, you know, 
uh, more and more organizations were created. Uh, very often, some of the new organizations or agencies would do part of what another agency was already doing, or people expanded their, you know, their, uh, their areas of activities. And I think there's excessive fragmentation in, in, in the UN system. Now, some fragmentation is, is fine. And I certainly wouldn't want to fall into the mistake of arguing for one big, you know, bureaucracy trying to do everything. I, I think these things don't work and, you know, some fragmentation, some decentralization is actually okay. But there is need for an overall strategy and overall coordination. And I think, you know, this is one of the big challenges, I guess, also for the philanthropic sector, for NGOs. On the one hand, you want to be very decentralized, you want to do a lot of things in a free way, have an idea, just go ahead and do it. On the other hand, it somehow has to fit together. You know, it, it cannot be totally fragmented. I do, I'm told, I wasn't there myself, but my, our representative in the conference on Afghanistan in London, which took place late January, you know, uh, told me that President Karzai said, you know, we love all the activity, but on the other hand, I have to be able to, to create a government, a state in Afghanistan, and I can't create it if 300 agencies are running around, each one doing their thing. And you have to help me create an Afghan state, because otherwise we won't make it. So you see there's that side to it too. So I think one has to balance these two things. And we're, in fact, tonight there's a dinner uh, which is l launching a new panel chaired by three prime ministers on looking into this whole, you know, how to make the whole system more effective. Now, let me give you one example which shows that there is some progress, but also shows the problems. The Peace Building Commission. You know, the, the summit in September did decide to create a, a, a peace building commission and then finally the General Assembly endorsed the idea. And really, I mean, one way to look at it is that the peace building commission will be able to do some, it will be advisory only, so it doesn't have the executive decision making power, let's say, of the Security Council, but it will bring together representatives of the Security Council and other countries in trying to chart the way for, for peace in, in certain parts of the world. Let's take Haiti. You know, if, if a meeting of the new peace building commission on Haiti will take place, there will be the Security Council representatives, there will be representatives from the Caribbean and Latin America who have a special interest in Haiti regionally, and there will be those countries who provide lots of resources to peace building. So, you know, so it's a political structure that is more inclusive than the Security Council, and I think that's a great idea. Now, should one at the same time as we create this new peace building commission, create a new peace building agency? You know, a new bureaucracy with a new whatever undersecretary for peace building, uh, with another, you know, 100 staff that will then soon become 200? Or should one say, no, wait a minute, there are existing organizations who cover some of the work that needs to be done. UNHCR deals with refugees. Uh, you know, uh, WHO deals with health problems, UNDP with development issues. So let the existing agencies do that work in a coordinated way and let's not create another agency. And I think that's how I would like to approach it because in the past, too often, every idea has created a new agency. There's, there's a Turkish story about the man who borrows a pot. Yeah, you know so that story, might, wow. You might share the story. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. But uh, this, is a, this is a very good, good story, I think, because there is a Turkish Sufi you know, philosopher uh, in, 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 the, in the story books and children's books. Actually, the, the, these books, you can find them from China all the way to Morocco. And one day, his neighbor comes and, uh, uh, you know, uh, borrows a pot. And, oh, sorry, no, he goes to his neighbor and says, I need a pot. And the neighbor says, okay, when are you going to give it back to me? And he says, well, you know, in, in a week or so. So the neighbor gives him a pot. And then the neighbor comes back after a week. And the, the Sufi gives his neighbor a pot with a small pot inside. And uh, so the neighbor says, but I only, you know, lent you one pot. He said, well, that's the baby. He made a baby. And, you know, I, I, since he's, he's the mother, uh, I, she's the mother, or, you know, I have to give it back to you. So the neighbor is very happy and says, well, I can make a lot of pots this way. So he then, in, in, after a little while, uh, you know, he again lends the hoja a pot. And then one week goes by, two weeks go by, three, no, nothing happens. So he goes, and where's my pot? 
And the Sufi says, he died. <laughs> so he said, how can a pot die well? You know, if it can make babies, it can die. <laughs> so, but unfortunately, bureaucracies, that doesn't work. They you just know? make babies. <laughs> you make a lot of babies, but you live forever. Andrew Natsios talked yesterday a little bit about UN development assistance and you know, UN develop, US development assistance tends to be driven by strategic interests, by political interests, there's Andrew right there, um, rather than so much by a development, uh, a clear development uh, goal. Are we measuring uh, its success in the right way, given that, number one? And number two, is the innovation of the Millennium Challenge account um, a perhaps a, a Trojan horse, a, a, an opportunity to revolutionize the way we do bilateral aid? Well, this is a huge, fascinating, and very crucial topic. You know, it's, it's important also for philanthropic aid, you know, for private sector aid. I mean, how effective really is aid, you know? And I think that's what it comes down to, and particularly, uh, should, should one have conditionalities and, and you know, or, or should, should one say, well, aid is aid and we give and we don't ask for much? I, I, my, my experience, and you know, there's a big debate, of course, on this. I don't pretend that I, I have the truth, but I do believe in the usefulness of aid, of resources provided for development, provided, on the other side, there, are, there is at least a, a, a a minimum of institutional capacity and a political will on reform and on, on using that aid reasonably well. I mean, perfection, you know, is not of, of this world. So I think you need to have the resources, but you also need to have the institutions and, and the political will. In the past, and I think that's, I also saw that statement by Andrew, I think two weeks ago, or maybe a little longer, where he did say, and I agree with him, a lot of aid in the past you know, ha was channeled not really for developmental purposes, but often, not always, but often for very political purposes. You know, there is the famous uh, quote, which, I mean, I'm not going to use the bad language, but of, I think it was Truman, actually, talking about Somoza. And some, you know, the U.S. was helping Somoza in Nicaragua, and somebody told President Truman, he's a really bad guy. And he, it was a worse, worse word than bad guy. And he said, well, he's our bad guy. You know? And the same was true for the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviets helped their, you know, their allies. And I think that colored a lot the, the nature of aid. So by, by, by looking in the past and seeing whether aid has been effective or not, I think one has to keep that in mind. Um, you you, you want to measure the effectiveness of something that really was channeled for the right purpose and, and not measure the development impact of giving money to Somoza so he can remain the staunch ally, you know, military ally of the United States or of, in the old days in, in Africa, many regimes like that. But on the other hand, I will tell you uh, another story on, on conditionality, which I find also very interesting because, um, you know, conditionality or conditions attached to aid are a very debatable topic. And I would be the first to say that if you try to impose conditions from abroad, and, and hope that without a domestic reform effort, these conditions are going to make your aid productive, I think it's not going to work. You, you need a domestic reform effort. You need, you know, the, the whole thing has to be driven domestically. However, I think you can help. And here I'll tell you a story. When I was at the World Bank, I had just been promoted to become director of a certain region. There was a particular country which I really liked, a lot of sympathy for. And I remember even, in, even today, when I was sitting in the plane going to the country and I was going to negotiate a big loan, I said, look, I'm not going to impose conditionality on that country. I mean, you know, it's their country and we're here there to help. And so I, you know, I told myself, you know, I'm going to be very flexible, very, very nice. So we started the negotiations next day and the chief negotiator was, was the head of the ministry. He was not the minister, but one level below. Kept asking for this and that and I tried to resist. But in the end, I gave in on most things you know, with the, in the general line, if that's what they want, if that's the thing that... And in the end, he said, can I have a drink with you in the hotel in the evening? I said, sure. And he came, and he said, Kemal, what have you done? You agreed to everything I asked for. I said, well, yeah, you, I mean, you know, I, I think you know what you're doing. He said, no, but you had to disagree because I, you know, I need you to help fight the powers that be, the, you know, the vested interests and so on. 
So you, you, you really did a terrible thing in agreeing to everything. <laughs> and this is a true story. So it is an example that you know, some policy conditionalities uh, focused on institutions, on transparency, but also on policies are, I think, useful. They have to be reasonable and they have to be adapted to the particular circumstances. But I think money alone, you know, without the policies, without the institutions, isn't the answer. Now, if we increase our aid, mm -hmm. as we have, um, and if we, if the uh, donor countries reduce the debt, which they will, um, and there is a large scandal, a large case of corruption, as Andrew would note, would that set back this new consensus for increased aid? Would that delegitimize aid in the end? And if so, what role can philanthropists play in supporting watchdog organizations in country that will monitor what their countries do and hold their governments to account? It definitely would. A big corruption scandal somewhere you know, particularly in a country, if it were to happen in a country that received, uh, you know, a lot of the new aid, would definitely uh, be a huge setback and would delegitimize the effort. I do believe that civil society's role as a watchdog, you know, in, in, in all countries, I mean, uh, in the U.S., but certainly in developing countries is much weaker, is very important. You, you want an active civil society to be there, you know, to scrutinize the budget, to look at uh, what's happening, to have newsletters, to, to debate, you know, have debate on what's going on. And I think that is a major incentive, uh, I think, to, do, to, to be more transparent for governments. And the more transparent things are, the less you, you have a chance for a major corruption scandal. Now, on the other hand, there's one other dimension to it, Jane, and you, we talked before, and I know you, you're interested in that, and that is the the capacity of the civil service and their ability to make ends meet. I think we have to look at this you know, honestly and seriously. Uh, when you have civil servants in, in some countries who are quite skilled, some of them, uh, who make $200, $300 a, you know, a month salary, it's a big problem. It's a very huge problem. And if we really want development to work, I, I do believe we also have to invest in the ability of the civil service to, to perform. And part of that performance is you know, not a luxurious, obviously, living standard. We, you know, developing countries can't afford that. But at least a, a kind of decent living standard to, to the cadre of people who are doing the important reforms and, and doing the important work. Otherwise, they will either migrate away or they will go and maybe join an oil company in, the, in their own country, which is fine, but you know, the civil service will lose them. Or, unfortunately, they will try to somehow find the resources in not so honest ways. You know? So I think we have to face this. The, the donor community has to face the fact that we need, as partners in the developing countries, civil services who, you know, where people have a decent salary. And if that means for the very poor countries that we have to for a while subsidize that. I think it's more justified than flying in another hundred consultants who, you know, are very skilled people and who often get paid, you know, what the going salary is in, in international markets, who may be doing a good job for two or three weeks, but then fly out and really don't create the capacity inside the country. How important is it to, to embed emerging civil servants, emerging leaders um, coming through the civil service in wider transnational networks? In other words, to uh, have members of the judiciary interact with members of the judiciary from other countries, uh, customs officials interact with customs officials from other countries. Is this kind of, is the philanthropy that supports that kind of interaction and investment in the pro professionalization. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it has tremendous uh, knowledge effects because th these officials can learn from each other. Uh, it also creates, um, how shall I put it, a kind of dedication to excellence and you know, 
and, and to a good civil service by having this, in, this international team spirit among lawyers, among finance, finance sector supervisors, among you know, uh, whoever. So I think encouraging this is very, very important. And that way the best practices you know, spread in, in a very good way. Anne Mary Slaughter, the dean of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, you know, that's one of her big ideas networks of officials working together. So financing that, helping that, also having these official networks meet with private sector networks, business networks, and discussing things of common interest, I think is, is extremely useful, extremely important. And final point, you know, on conditionality again, on this issue of conditions. There's a new move, which is very good, I think we have to go as fast as we can in that direction, that the, the policy advice and supervision shouldn't be just from rich country people, you know, supervising developing country people. It should be networks of developing country people getting together and looking at what each other is doing. You know, the NEPAD in Africa. Uh, getting peer review, having other African countries look at what you're doing if you're an African country. Also getting some Asians, Latin Americans, you know, cross, cross continent. I think that can make uh, uh, the policy conditionality much more acceptable than if it's perceived as some kind of neo-colonial, you know, uh, imposing from northern ex-colonial powers on, onto developing countries. So just, that, that is very important. Just to clarify, I think when most people hear the word conditionality, they think in terms only of macroeconomic policy. And you're talking much more broadly. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, health sector, delivery systems, education, getting s girls in school. I mean, the, you know, the program that Lula in Brazil, for example, which is quite successful, actually, where the, where the uh, help that is given to the poorest families in terms of cash is conditioned on making sure that they send their kids to school and that they get the kids immunized. Okay, two very important two things. And the ca that's a form of conditionality. You, you don't give the money just without any strings attached. You make sure that there are some behavioral uh, actions that, that, that go with it. So in essence, it's, pro, it, it's, conditional, it's conditioning aid on pro-poor pro pro policies. Poor, exactly, yeah. right. Uh, let me just go back to, to the question of, of corruption just for a moment and, and, and focus a little bit on, on the role that the private sector can play, the positive role it can play. Alan Dethridge is here from Shell, and I know that Shell and British Petroleum have decided to, a few years ago, to publicly post any payment they make to a government official uh, so that any citizen of that country will know and can hold that government official to account. How useful are activities like that in opening up, in sort of being the beginning of opening up of a system? I think very, very useful. I mean, transparency is definitely you know, the, the answer to, to many of these problems. And we now have the internet, we have, you know, we, 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 we can able to, we are able to publicize such things. So I think the more the private sector adopts a code of conduct, which makes sure that it's transparent, uh, the more it will help. Uh, so I, I, I'm very supportive of that. And as I said, we, we have to work on, you know, on many, many dimensions of the problem. Uh, Transparency comes, I think, is maybe the most important dimension. But as I said, also making sure that the, you know, the director general in charge of energy projects in country X, you know, doesn't have to survive on two hundred dollars is, is another side which we shouldn't forget. Which is something we talked about last night with Sam Nunn, with respect to those who handled nuclear weapons material. I see. That yeah. that that was a no-brainer. Uh, in an issue like that. But of course, it's equally a no-brainer uh, with someone who's handling uh, the, 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 the public, yeah. looking out for the public good in other ways. Um, one of the new developments, one, one of the things that, that's uh, lacking in many countries uh, is, is an independent policy voice, independent sources of policy uh, options, independent sources of analysis. And I know the Hewlett Foundation just at a board meeting at which they approved a hundred million dollar uh, fund for the purpose of developing think tanks throughout the developing world. 
Where do you see, what kind of role could you see private think, or uh, independent think tanks playing, and where are they most needed? I think they're needed, um, I mean, they really are needed in the developing world. I mean, I, I think um, Americans are so lucky to have this world of think tanks, of networks, where people generate ideas, debate. When you don't have that, when the whole debate is just between the government party and the opposition party, you know, it, it, it's not a sufficiently productive debate. Of course, that's also a very important part of democracy, but one has to animate that debate and feed it with knowledge, with statistics, and with independent ideas. I tried to launch a small think tank in Turkey after I resigned from being uh, in, in, in the ministry. It was very hard, very, very difficult. And, um, and I think you know, we succeeded in creating a very small group. But I really do believe that this is a hugely important line of activity. And uh, you know, it, it, it tremendous, I mean, how can citizens, for example, understand the budget? You know, um, the priorities that go into the budget. Some citizens may be interested more in the health sectors, others more in education. So who explains to them, well, that's what's being debated in the education part of the budget, for example. I, I really think these are very, very important things. And, and the developing countries really need help, both the experience of think tanks in the, in the richer countries, but also just some seed money. And then, you know, once it starts and once it becomes successful, and generate some good ideas, I think there, there, are also, there is money now in, in the developing countries too, in the emerging markets. But the private sector there isn't used yet to this kind of giving. And I think you know, by bringing it in also, one can have domestic sources of support. Let me take you to the Millennium Development Goals. That was a very large promise to the poor. Uh, will it be met? I think the Millennium Development Goals were truly a, a fantastic way to frame the problem. You know, I'm an economist. I've been taught to think in terms of per capita income, you know, $3,000, $600, whatever. But many people, it, it's not concrete enough. When you say development, what, what is it all about? And therefore, by, by telling the world that development is about mothers not dying when they give birth, is about children surviving, you know, their first few years, is about getting every child into primary school, making sure that people actually have access to clean water in, in, in their, where they live. I think these are very concrete ways of framing the objectives for development. And in that sense, I think the United Nations and the Secretary General and my predecessor, Mark Malik Brown, and all those who worked on that did a fantastic thing. Because I think, I, I hope you agree with me, they, they put energy into the, into the topic, new energy. And, and, and uh, new vitality, and I think greater relevance in terms of everyday people's concerns. Now, you know, whenever you adopt targets, there is a certain degree of arbitrariness. You know, uh, reducing maternal mortality by three quarters. Well, why three quarters? Why not 80 percent? You know, what you, you could argue about that. But I think in, in the end, these, these, these objectives were, were worked out. They're ambitious. They're very ambitious. I think we, we have another 10 years. I do believe with a huge effort on everybody's part, one can get very close to meeting them in most countries. But I think one also has to approach it in a somewhat flexible way. I mean, some countries will actually do better than achieving the MDGs. So we're encouraging them now to say MDG plus. You know, you're doing well, you're growing a lot. May, do even better. Other countries, mainly countries in conflict and with civil war and you know, complete lack of governance or really bad dictatorships, will probably not make it. You know, we can't claim that every country has, at this point, we only have nine years left. There are some countries which are so far at this point that I think you know, they, they won't be able to make it. But I don't think we should give up. We should continue pushing and we should use these Millennium Development Goals not as a once and for all you know, central plan for the world, but for a way of making development tangible and discussing with groups like, like yours, you know, how, can we, um, how, how can we link very concrete results to the resources deployed by the international community? I'm going to take you back to countries in conflict in a moment, but I first wanted to ask, what effect have Bono and others had 
on making it a political imperative for leaders uh, in OECD countries to take seriously the Millennium Development Goals? I think they've had a very positive effect. You know, I, I, I mean, I got into electoral politics. It was not easy. <laughs> I was, you know, at the World Bank, you know, more of a manager, bureaucrat, an academician. And I remember I got appointed to the Turkish government, um, you know, as a technocrat, not as an elected person. In fact, when in my first session in parliament, I made a mistake because there was a vote and I lifted my hand and they said, you don't have the right to vote. You're not elected. You're not an elected minister. Uh, and then, you know, in one big cabinet debate, one colleague got mad at me and said, you first get elect to, elected to a village council and then you try to tell us things, you know. So um, I, I learned, in, you know, I did get elected elected for Istanbul, by the way, and then I gave him a call and said, hey, this is better than a village council. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, politics, you, I mean, politicians do things, and that's democracy, you know, because their electorate wants them to do things. I mean, they have to get reelected. So it is, I think, true that unless there is a civil society citizens movement in favor of development efforts, in favor of debt relief, Politicians will not have great incentives to, to do these things. And therefore, Bono and others, you know, uh, have done a great service because they, many young people who don't really think that much about development started thinking about it. Sports is another area. You know, we, we, we're supporting these soccer games against poverty where we have big soccer stars in Europe assemble teams and play against each other and so on. So all these things are very, very important. And the Millennium Development Goals, again, you know, when I got this job when the Secretary General nominated me, I got emails from students all over the world saying, it's great that you're going to work for the Millennium Development Goals. I don't think I would have gotten emails, you know, please make sure per capita income grows by 4%, you know. But you, you need these, these visions, uh, I think, to, to make it happen. Now, back to you. you. You mentioned countries in conflict, and you certainly worked on, on post-conflict situations in the case of, of Bosnia. To what extent are dollars that might have otherwise gone to, um, to the poorest of the poor being, uh, you know, by necessity, allocated to dealing with the situation in Afghanistan and now in Iraq? Well, you know, one of the things I was terribly frustrated uh, when I was working on Bosnia, you know. Uh, it was really my first time when I was personally engaged in a, in a conflict situation and was in charge of that particular, for the World Bank. And, you know. I mean, the military didn't seem to have any budget constraint. I mean, they were, you know, I think Bosnia, I don't know how much it cost in the end, but, and, and you know, did good things in Bosnia. I mean, they actually stopped the war, saved people, and all that. But billions, 20, 25 billion, and then when we tried to mobilize 500 million, you know, for civilian purposes, it was almost impossible. So there are definitely different pockets. You know, military expenditures somehow get funded in a different way. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, the, and the numbers are huge. So the first point I'd like to make here, if, and you know, it's an if, one can debate the if, but if you can use some money to prevent conflict, you know, by diffusing some conflict situations, by funding some uh, projects, and thereby avoid conflict, you end up saving a huge amount of money for everybody. So I think that would be the first message I'd really like to, to make. And I think it's, it's a citizen's message. I mean, you know, you, citizens should really care about it because if there is a conflict, then it's the, you know, it's your taxpayers who are going to end up paying for it when it's too late, you know. Uh, I, I, I see we have little time left because I, I uh, but I think this is very, very, very important. And, and, and then, of course, when there is um, a post-conflict situation, one of the really tough things is how do you go from humanitarian aid to actual development? How do you go from the phase where you fly in tons of food and provide, you know, uh, temporary shelter, tents, to actually rebuilding a community, providing jobs, providing local governments, figure out the new property rights, land problems. That is a hugely different, uh, difficult transition which, where, where all of us have to do much better. NGOs, private sector, philanthropy, UN, governments, because we get stuck. 
In Bosnia, I think we were very successful in the, in the first two years. And then, 10 years later, you know, it's still an economy that's doing very badly, actually, and it's still being, you know, needs a lot of subsidies because somehow the, the movement from the reconstruction phase to the real development phase is very tough. So next time around, um, Andrew Natsios is going to get Don Rumsfeld's budget, and Don <laughs> Rumsfeld is going to get your budget. How's that? One last question. I just have a last question about what, one of the, probably in, in many ways, the most significant role of the United Nations is its capacity to build a consensus and identify what is an international norm? What is a shared value? Um, and the Secretary General recently, a couple of years ago, had a uh, panel, I think it was called on threats, challenges, and change, that argued that states have a duty pr to protect. They have a duty to protect their citizens. And if they don't, as in the case of Darfur, if they don't, the international community has not only a right, but a responsibility to intervene. Is this a real consensus? Do you expect governments to act? Well, I certainly hope they will. I mean, in the 20th century, and now, unfortunately, again, in some places, you know, we've seen terrible catastrophes and human tragedies happen, which could have been stopped. And there is a need, therefore, I mean, I do believe, you know, we, we can't talk about globalization and say that we're all in a global world and the markets are global and capitalism is global and at the same time allow terrible human tragedies to take place without any action, without any intervention. So I personally, and I think I reflect the Secretary General's view, that yes, there is a need for that. But I would add that the intervention has to be legitimate in the eyes of the international community. It has to be based on some norms, and that panel tried to work out some norms. It cannot be a situation where countries just, you know, intervene whenever they feel that they alone think they should. It has to be based on some kind of international uh, community of values. Because without that, it becomes much harder to achieve success the debate about motives, I mean, why are you intervening, is very hard to you know, win. And the burden sharing also is a big problem. Who's going to pay for these interventions? You know, Sudan or whatever. There has, there have to, be a multi, there has to be a multilateral system. It's going to be hard because there are going to be disagreements. You know? But we have to move towards a system where both for, for burden sharing reasons and for the legitimacy of the activity itself, you know, an intervention is backed by the international community. I think with that, with that provision, we have to. Kamal Dervish, thank you so much for spending this time with us.